I, I gave a talk on this topic uh, in 2015, six years ago now. I can't quite believe where the time's gone. But it is very remarkable, I think, that to this day, statisticians can't agree on the best method of doing simple statistical problems like testing whether the difference between the means of two independent samples is a real difference or whether it is a result of sampling error. And considering that that from the user's point of view is one of the main functions of statisticians, it's, it, that seems quite odd. Um, okay, here we go. get to full screen. Okay, so there we go. Um, this was articulated Today rather... I speak to you of war. A war that has pitted statistician against statistician for nearly 100 years. A mathematical conflict that has recently come to the attention of the normal people. And these normal people look on in fear, in horror, but mostly in confusion because they have no idea why we're fighting. That is, I fear, <laughs> absolutely the case. Um, when I first retired, I went back to a sort of a hobby I'd had <laughs> uh, when I was young, because the, in 2013, this was already getting to be quite a hot topic of discussion, had been for quite a while actually, I subsequently discovered. And I thought I'd do some simulations of t-tests to see how they, uh, how well they worked. So the, re the way I did these was to simply take random samples, two random samples. A and B, and I did them when, when there was no difference between the true means, and I did them again when there was a difference of one standard deviation between the two means, and simply counted the number of false positives. And if you'd observed P equals 0.05, it came out to 26%, which quite surprised me, but that's only because I wasn't familiar with the literature. There's plenty of reason to think that a value like that is um, is realistic. Uh, notice that when I did the simulations with the uh, true mean difference between the two samples, I did it with the same true mean for every replication. If I'd been Bayesian, I would have picked a mean from a, a prior distribution. Uh, but this picking of a mean from a prior distribution, okay, I know it doesn't mean that the parameters really varying, it's just the degree of belief in parameter values that's varying. Uh, but mine seemed to be the case that corresponded to reality because in real life, you can legitimately assume that the parameter you're trying to estimate doesn't vary from one experiment to another, especially in our case where we were trying to estimate physical rate constants, physico-chemical quantities, which you could reasonably assume to be constant from one repetition to another. Um, to my complete astonishment, this paper, perhaps because it was rather naive and perhaps because it was not very mathematical, has been downloaded over a quarter of a million times and it's racked up a lot more citations than it deserves. Um, but the question was interesting, so I kept on with a few more investigations of it in 2017 when I did the, the maths with a little help. So I didn't have to simulate. And in 2019, in the issue of the American statistician that was devoted to the world beyond P less than 0.05. And this was 
an, an interesting addition of the American statistician, if only because there was absolutely no unanimity. There were 40 odd proposals, almost every one of which was different. Some were probably the majority were too vague to be very useful, in my opinion, people saying, well, just consider your p-value carefully. Well, that's easier said than done, of course. There's only really one that agreed with me, and that was, in, in principle, that was Jim Berger from, um, from Duke University. Um, so this is going to be like teaching your grandmother to count eggs to, to you guys, but I'll just go through it anyway. The p-value is defined as there, and what's wrong with it? Um, well, there's nothing wrong with it because it's defined in a way it does what it says on the can. The trouble is, what it says on the can, when you think about it, is actually almost uninterpretable. It, it, you really can't tell what's, um, what it tells you. Uh, what we need, I think, is the false positive risk, which is the fraction of all positive tests. The, the, it differs in the denominator. We not we don't want to condition on the total number of tests, but on the number of positive tests. Uh, I, I should emphasize at this stage that the false positive risk refers to how to interpret a p-value from a single experiment. It doesn't refer to the problem of multiple comparisons I rather stupidly used the term false discovery rate in that first paper, but I still, uh, I then changed it to false positive rate. But um, David Spiegelhalter, in, when I corresponded with him about it, said, you know, if you're referring to one experiment, it should be risk, not rate. So I've settled on false positive r risk now. But he doesn't refer to the problem of multiple comparisons uh, which is where the term false discovery rate is commonly used. Multiple comparisons usually tries to correct the type one error rate. So it, it gives you a sort of corrected p-value and that subject has the same problems as any other p-value. Now I reckon there's at least five things dubious about the definition of p-values. The first is if there were actually no effect the premise for the calculation of a p-value is that the null hypothesis is true. So they can't possibly tell you anything about whether the null hypothesis is or isn't true. And that's what you want to know, damn it. The very definition says that it can't tell you what you want to know. Uh, another way of looking at that is to say that if there are actually no effect, it implies the denominator for the probability is the number of cases in which there is no effect and that's not known. Another worrying thing about the definition is, is or greater than, why on earth should we be interested in values that haven't been observed? If we want to interpret ex an experiment, a single experiment, we've got one set of data and it gives one p-value and other p-values have no interest whatsoever. One problem, of course, is that it's not comparative. We need an alternative hypothesis as well as the null. Um, Selke, Bayari, and Berger put it very well in 2001, knowing that the data are rare when there's no true difference is of little use unless one determines whether or not they also, they're also rare when there is, is, is a true difference. That makes it very obvious. And lastly, of course, the definition risks making the error of the transposed conditional, the um, the probability that you're you're a Catholic, given that you're the Pope, is probably rather high. The probability that you're Pope, given that you're a Catholic, is very low. So, what are we going to do about this? These suggestions are not aimed at professional statisticians, because they know what they're doing, and by and large anyway. <laughs> uh, and the trouble is most p-values in the literature are not generated by professional statisticians. They're generated by amateurs who these days got a, a computer program which will turn out a p-value for them. 
So these are the premises for the suggestion. Users will continue to use statistical tests with the aim of trying to avoid making fools of themselves by publishing false positive results. And that's entirely laudable. Most users will not have access to professional statistical advice. When I, when I was doing these things, I always used to go and badger statisticians and they were mostly helpful, but most people don't. And, and if they did, you'd be inundated, of course, because there just simply aren't enough statisticians to go around. Thirdly, the only way to stop people claiming a discovery whenever they observe P less than 0.05 is to give them some alternative procedure. And that alternative procedure preferably has to be simple enough that they can understand more or less of what's going on. This is unlikely to ever be a full Bayesian analysis. That has a real place in, for example, in formal clinical trials, when a professional statistician can do them, but it's too complicated for most users. And most users distrust, rightly in my view, informative priors. They, in my 1971 textbook, where I got this all completely wrong, actually, I, I said that using an informative prior is like presuming the answer before you've done the experiment, and we'll come back to that. Um, Subjective Bayesian testing procedures have not been and will likely never be generally accepted by the scientific community. I think that's right. I mean, you say you can guard against the prior problem by using all sorts of different priors and doing a sensitivity analysis. But if that were done for every p-value that's published, <laughs> the literature would double in volume instantly. Um, on the other hand, the problem is that the question that we want to answer is in fact the Bayesian question. What I found particularly appealing was this dictum of Eric Wagenmacher's, at least Bayesians attempt to find an approximate answer to the right question, instead of struggling to interpret an exact answer to the wrong question, the second bit being of course p-values. And you really do have to struggle to interpret a p-value in a proper way. I maintain it's actually impossible for the reasons I've given. So what I would advocate is a special case of the Bayesian analysis. It's simple enough to be widely understood and it allows the p-value to be supplementing the confidence limits to be supplemented by a single number that gives a much better idea of the strength of the evidence than a p-value alone. P-values clearly don't measure the strength of the evidence. So I'll consider this in the, in the context of assessing the difference between the means of two independent samples. In practice, your conclusions from such an experiment are really likely to be one of two options. You conclude that there's little evidence for there being a real effect or to conclude that a real effect probably exists and our best estimate of its size is the observed difference between means. And this suggests that the simplest approach is to compare the evidence for a null hypothesis that the mean difference is zero with the evidence for the alternative hypothesis that the mean difference is the observed mean difference. Now, what this means is really, this, this, this is a picture taken from a, a talk given by Richard Morey, which I found particularly clear. What, what it means, I think, is that I'm suggesting using this as a prior. So it's not strictly true when I say I, I'm not <laughs> assuming a prior distribution. I'm comparing this with the alternative for a two-sided test. Um, well, that seems to me an entirely reasonable thing to do. And this formulation of the problem has several advantages. The Bayes factor becomes a likelihood ratio. And 
the likelihood ratio is purely frequentist and it's easy to explain to users. That's a huge advantage because it gets rid of the prior distribution problem in a sense. So the likelihood ratio in favor of there being a real effect of the observed size, that's what the one zero subscript means on the left, not 10, it's one zero, is, is the probability of the observations given the, your alternative hypothesis divided by the probability of your observations given by the null hypothesis. Now, you can convert those odds to a probability in the standard way. Just calculate one on one plus the odds. And that's what I call the false positive risk 50. It's 50 and the reason for the 50 is uh, about to be explained. There's no need to interpret the probability in the Bayesian way because it's it depends entirely on frequentist quantities. Uh, but application of Bayes theorem shows that it's the posterior probability of there being no effect in the case where the prior odds are one, where the prior probability of the null hypothesis and the alternative are both 0 0.5, 50, 50, that's where the 50 subscript comes from. Now you might say, is this a maximum false positive risk or is it a minimum one? Well, it's both actually, depending on how you look at it. If the prior probability of there being a real effect is less than 50-50, then the false positive risk will be bigger. But if you, if you take the view that it isn't legitimate in the absence of hard data to assume any prior probability of a real effect bigger than 0 0.5, that's to uh, bias the answer, then the, false posit pos then the false positive risk is the smallest probability of a positive result being a false positive that can be claimed from the data. In another sense, though, it, it, the false positive risk might be too high because of the lump of probability which you're putting on the null hypothesis. Um, this question of the point null though it's what the point null of course is the basis of every null hypothesis significance test but suddenly people take against it when it comes to uh, these sort of arguments because they say the difference can't possibly be exactly zero well it can of course if you're testing a homeopathic pill against a placebo the pills are two pills are identical and the point null is exactly appropriate there are cases where it's not appropriate but i think in many cases it is appropriate it doesn't have to be exactly zero of course it can be a small interval around zero and that's okay it doesn't change the result perceptibly What about the 50-50 bit? Well, it's the nearest you can get to equipoise. If you're testing extrasensory perception or homeopathic pill, it'll clearly be much too optimistic to say there's a 50% effect, 50% prior probability of there being a real effect. Um, but in general, most bright ideas don't work. And in that, case I don't think it's a sufficiently I don't think it's excessively skeptical to say that there's a 50 50 chance before the experiment of there being a real effect is just realistic there's one thing that confused me at first I did tumble to it in the first two papers it's often not explained clearly in the literature, especially the more mathematical papers, that there's two quite different ways of calculating the likelihood ratio. And this is, this is the value of students t plotted against probability density for the null hypothesis with a mean of zero. And for the alternative hypothesis, we have a non-central t distribution. This is for the case of two samples of 16 observations with the difference between the means of 
one standard deviation. That gives 2.0 t, t value of 2.04 for p equals 0.05. If you look at it the conventional frequentist way, you calculate the likelihood ratio as 0.78, the power divided by the significance level. But we don't want that. What you want in this case is not the probability that includes more extreme values than we have observed. We want the, all we've got is what's observed. So what we want is the is the likelihood ratio applicable to what's observed. So we don't want the areas here. We want the probability densities. Uh, now the the so that's the probability of observing exactly. Um, t equals 2.04 in the case where the null hypothesis is true. This is the prob probability of observing it when the alternative hypothesis is true. Their probability densities, of course, they're infinitesimal, but their ratio is absolutely well defined. And if you calculate it that way, you get a much lower uh, likelihood ratio of 2.8. So it's fair to say that if you observe p equals 0.05, the likelihood ratio is not going to be much different from 3. Consequently, the false positive risk, the 50% the value, is going to be not much different from 1 over 1 plus 3, which is 25% agrees pretty much with what I found from simulations. So when you do the exact calculations, you can plot these things as curve curves. Let's first look at the false positive risk as a function of the observed p-value. Just this, the purpose of this is to show the difference between the p equals method of calculation of the likelihood ratio and the p less than one. I, I, amazingly, I found no name in the literature for these two different approaches. Bayesians usually use p equals um, sort of by default. But it clarified it a lot once I realized that they were there. So the, the top row is for an implausible hypothesis. The bottom row is for a prior of 0.5. So let's just concentrate on the bottom row. In fact, if you look at just at the bottom right hand one that's on a log log scale, we can see that the false positive risk calculated by the p equals method is always much bigger than the p value. If it were equal, it would lie on that red line of equality. It's interesting that using the p less than method, they differ very little. So they, that has caused some people to think that this doesn't matter. But first, the p less than method is not appropriate, I think. And also, if you get to lower p values, the even that method gives you a, a bigger false positive risk than the, the p value. So everything else will be done by the p equals approach, because that's the one that answers the question we're interested in, I believe. So now the false positive risk as a function of the observed p-value again, but with curves for different values of n, the number per sample. This is, again, for the case where the difference between means is one standard deviation. Uh, we, we can look just at this bottom right-hand one, which is on a log-log scale, and for a prior probability of 0.5. It's interesting that the curves actually cross here for the different sample sizes, but they don't differ very, very much for p equals 0.05. That puzzled me in the first paper because I said they seem to be surprisingly independent of power. But once you get down to lower p values, they're in the order you expect. The n equals 4 gives you a much bigger false positive risk than the n equals 8, and that gives you a bigger false positive risk than n equals 14, but they're all much bigger than the p-value, which is the red dashed line. Uh, 
Now the FPR 50 as a function of the number of observations in each sample. This was really enlightening. Um, because the, and it's plotted for several different p-values, let's just concentrate on p equals 0.05. The minimum false positive risk is actually not at n equals 16, but it's at n equals about eight actually, but it's fairly flat over the range up to here. But then it heads towards one. Someone uh, after the first paper noticed this and says, surely that's not right uh, but it actually is right and it's the only sensible thing notice that the power there is enormously through this curve for n equals four which is the smallest sample plotted the power is 0.22 for n equals 16 the power is 0.78 which is a conventional sort of value but for n equals 64, the power is 99.99%. No, no one ever does an experiment that gives you a power like that, though some large scale data possibly can. And of course, the question of what that means is one that's been discussed quite a lot for these reasons. The fact is that in the conventional frequentist view, any difference, however small, will become significant as the sample size goes to infinity. On the other hand, according to this view, a a any difference eventually becomes evidence for the null hypothesis when the sample, when the power is big enough. And this, of course, is just the Jeffries Lindley phenomenon. And it's very easy to explain it's because if you have a power of 99.9%, you expect to detect every difference. And that means that all the p-values will be much less than 0.05. If you have a power of 99.9% .9 and you observe a p-value as big as 0.05, that's very suspicious because most of the p-values in that case would be very much smaller than that. And it's easy just to check that with simulation. I've got some numbers in one of the papers. Uh, of course, it applies to any p-value, even with p-values 0.001, it, it'll eventually get to a false positive risk of one, but it's pretty slow to do so. Uh, I think this is exactly how a, a test of significance sh should function actually. Of course, we supplied our programs to um, to work out these things with the papers in the conventional way now. But I found, I think not many people download them and actually use them. So we thought we'd better use a web calculator. This is a, a shiny app that I wrote with a little help, quite a lot of help from uh, friends. They, uh, they're not exactly obvious how to do them. And uh, you can find it at fpr-calc.ucl.ac.uk. I thought it'd be nice to have a UCL address. And I found a very helpful woman called Raquel Allegri in um, the IT department who set it all up for me and gave it that address. Then UCL decided it couldn't afford the server any longer and destroyed it, so this didn't work. Um, however, I had a backup copy on a Danish server run, sorry, a, a, a Dutch server run by Daniel Lakens in in uh, Eindhoven. It was rather kind of him to put it on his server because um, he doesn't agree with me about these things by and large. Um, that, had, that had a much more complicated URL and the way they had it set up in Eindhoven meant that this couldn't be redirected to, to my app. So it does still work and it works by courtesy of a very smart bloke at Positive Internet. Positive Internet is a wonderful green company which 
is a company with a conscience. It hosts my blogs and it doesn't even charge me for it because they like uh, skeptical stuff, I guess. Um, perhaps I shouldn't have said that because everyone will be asking for free blogs. But some, someone there uh, figured out how to embed the Eindhoven server in a page which was addressable by uh, redirection from this address. So it does still work. And all, th there are There are three things, there's three calculations you can do. You can calculate the prior probability for a given false positive risk and p-value, that's sort of reverse Bayes. You can calculate the p-value for a given FPR and prior, or you can calculate the false positive risk for a given p-value and prior. So this is the default option now. If you put in 0.049, prior probability of 0.5, 16 in each sample, effect size of one. Oops. Then you get this on the output panel. You get a false positive risk of 26% and a likelihood ratio of 2.8, the power conventional power for these numbers is 78 percent and that's read exactly with what I got from the simulation so that was seemed satisfactory a table might be easier for some conventional p value values for 0.05 the reverse Bayes method which I liked at first but I'm not so sure about it now shows that if you wanted to have a five percent FPR 50 you need to be a prior probability of a real effect of 87%. And that really puts it in perspective, I think. Can you imagine submitting a paper saying, I've discovered an effect and it's, I think it's real on the grounds that I assumed in advance, I was almost 90% sure it was real. They, I mean, you'd just be laughed out of the, um, out of court, but this is the situation. Um, the likelihood ratio is uh, 2.8, about 3, and that means, of course, that the observations are about three times more likely under the alternative hypothesis than under the null hypothesis. So that's, all, that's evidence against the null hypothesis, but it's pretty weak evidence. A ratio of three to one is not very much compared with the value of 19 to one, which many people still erroneously presume that P equals 0.05 means. So one on one plus 2.8 is 27%, the FPR 50. If it's an implausible hypothesis though, the false positive risk shoots up, it's 76% if you have a prior probability of a real effect of one, of point one, sorry. If you take P equals point oh one, then the prior needed for 5% false positive risk is only 55%, not uh, much more than half. The Likelihood ratio is 15, which is much stronger evidence. The false positive risk is still bigger than 0.05, but not much bigger, as long as it's a plausible hypothesis. If it's an implausible hypothesis, the prior of 0.1, then you still have a 37% false positive risk with P equals 0.001. In fact, in that case, it would still be bigger than 5% with P equals 0.001. So, is this plausible? Well, I think it is, if only because two other methods of dealing with the problem come up with really very similar answers. The first one is far predates mine, which is from Selke, Berger and Bayari. Then you recently I realized um, 
Bauri was a woman actually, and she only when she unfortunately died, rather young, very sad. Um, they also assume a point null hypothesis, and in that sense, it's a skeptical approach. But they work out the upper bound on the Bayes factor in favor of there being a real effect is given by this very simple expression, P is the observed P value, E is the exponential E. So their version of the FPR 50 would be this for P equals 0.05, you get a, a Bayes factor of two and a half compared with 2.8 by my method, a false positive risk of 29% rather than 26%. They're essentially identical. They don't agree quite so well for lower p-values, but otherwise they're very similar. This originates from a 1987 paper, which says in the abstract, data that yield a p-value of 0.05 when testing a normal mean result in a posterior probability of the null of at least 30% any objective prior distribution. Objective here means that the, well, they explain what it means there. Um, so that's really very close to mine. Um, Valen Johnson has come up with a similar answer to the same problem using uniformly most powerful Bayesian tests. He picks a prior out of a large class of priors which maximizes the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis. And then again, it doesn't reject the null hypothesis nearly as often as the p-value would do. In other words, p-values as commonly misinterpreted overestimate the evidence against uh, the null hypothesis. Um, in fact, this is really just a, mine's just a direct derivative of something suggested by Stephen Goodman 20 years ago. Um, he uses the a normal distribution. I use T distributions. If you use a normal distribution for a two-sided test, then the likelihood ratio comes out to be that. And once again, you calculate the FPR 50. That that way. And in, in the twenty nineteen paper in American Statistician, I compare these three approaches. You can see, not surprisingly, that mine agrees rather closely with, <coughs> with Goodman's. Um, the selke Bayari limit is always a bit higher, though they, they, it's similar around the most sensitive region of 0.05. It gives you about twice the false positive risk of mine for lower p-values. The factor of two doesn't make that much difference actually to the way you interpret the, the results in practice. So let's take a particular example. This is something published in Science magazine they tweeted it excitedly saying that transcranial electric stimulation of the brain improved memory performance. Well, that doesn't seem particularly plausible to me, but let's give it the benefit of the doubt and give it a prior of 0.5. And they said P equals 0.043. This, the, most of the paper wasn't about this at all. It was about functional magnetic resonance imaging. This was just a subsection of one figure Uh, and they've got one asterisk against this comparison with sham. And they excitedly concentrated in their tweets about it, Science Magazine, as well as authors, that they discover how to improve your memory. Anything with memory on gets a good old metric score because people like it on Twitter. Um, but P equals 0.043, I reckon, means that at least an 80% chance that it's a false positive. 
uh, and this analysis wasn't picked up by they, the fact that they say they get it with stuff reviewed by the American Statistical Association, but that wasn't the case, I think. In order to even to find the number per sample in this science uh, paper, you had to delve into the supplementary material. These glamour magazines really are pretty awful when it comes to method sections. But if you plug it into the calculator, p equals 0.043, prior probability of a real effect, 0 0.5, number in each sample was eight, turned out, and the effect size was 1.1 standard deviations. And the output was, I'll enlarge it a bit to make it more visible, a false positive risk, 50 of 18%, a likelihood ratio of 4.5. So I'd suggest four methods of stating this result, which are better than that given in the paper. The result given in the paper just said P equals 0.043, a quote, statistically significant result that uh, um, I would have appended to that that it implies a false positive risk of around 18%. So that result is no more than suggestive, certainly not very definite. Or you could use a different radio button on the web calculator to calculate that. In order to reduce the false positive risk to 0 0.05, it would be necessary to assume that we were almost certain a prior probability of 81% that there was a real effect before the experiment was done. There's no independent evidence for this assumption, so the result is no more than suggestive. That's the reverse Bayes approach. Or you could use another option to say the increase in performance gave P equals 0.043 in order to reduce the false positive risk to 0 0.05, it would be necessary to observe P equals 0 0.0043. So the result is no more than suggestive. The trouble is with options two and three, they both uh, involve postulating a, a, another bright line, a false positive risk of 0 0.05. Well, I don't really like bright lines, so I, I suggest using either one or number four, which doesn't need Bayes at all. That would be just to use the likelihood ratio. The observations are about four and a half to one more probable under the hypothesis that the true effect is that observed as it is under the hypothesis that the true effect is zero. Now, four and a half to one is some evidence for there being a real effect, but it's much less than the 19 to one odds, which people continue to mistakenly infer from P equals point. So the result is no more than suggestive. What should you do to avoid making a fool of yourself? Never use the words significant or non-significant or those associated pesky asterisks. Note that it's a fundamental assumption of all significant tests that treatments are allocated at random. When this isn't the case, the tests are not interpretable. Perhaps it's a better term than invalid state a p-value and give an estimate of the effect size with confidence intervals but be aware that it tells you nothing directly about the false positive risk so state also the false positive risk 50 as a rough estimate of the false positive risk in one sense it's the smallest false positive risk that's expected but in another sense it's pessimistic because of the point null hypothesis and the upshot is that P equals 0.04. Doesn't mean you've discovered something, it means it might be worth another look. Uh, of course, the problem is essentially Bayesian and that means it has an infinitude of solutions. Mine seems to be, a, my suggestion seems to be a simple, well, actually Stephen Goodman's suggestion, I, I think we should say, um, a simple answer which gives a simple uh, approach, which is 
capable of being explained to users and which gives an approximate answer to the right question. It doesn't struggle to interpret. The, um, the P value, which I think is uninterpretable. Um, I've had some good discussions with many people about these problems. I found Stephen Sen and Leo Helt from Zurich particularly helpful. Also Robert Matthews, who's done good stuff in this field. He um, wrote this rather incendiary uh, piece in the newspaper in uh, a while ago, which is probably not quite fair, but it's not without truth. Um, Stephen Sen you, will be known to many of you because he used to work at UCL for a while and gave seminars there since. Uh, he said, you know, as statisticians at the moment, we are struggling to converge on whether we are converging or not, to which my reply was rolling on the floor laughing. But I did actually pin him down in the end. I said, one for you, if the observed P is 0.049 and you claim there's an effect, do you agree that there are plausible arguments that your risk of being mistaken is over 20%? Or do you think that this probability can't be calculated? Or do you believe that it's not an informative thing to estimate? Uh, and he says, I think the probability can't be calculated. That's dead right, it's Bayesian. There are many assumptions you can make. I think your probability could be calculated. Well, that's true. And for some purposes, I think there is a risk of being mistaken of 20% is not bad. So he, he doesn't actually, despite being uh, somebody who will always argue against anything you propose, uh, disagree in any serious way with my conclusions. What I said in 1971 remains true. It's difficult to give a consensus of informed opinion because although there is much informed opinion, there is rather little consensus. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you.